one of the things you learn very quickly in being devoted or in a devotional life that's dedicated to serving God is if you're serving God, then you will serve others, but you must be serving God because people, <laughs> when you deal with them, you'll find they have all kinds of things they want you to do. They'll tell you you're not doing this right or that right or this is wrong and that is wrong. And they're going to want you to do all kinds of things that maybe you don't know how to do. You know, like go out and, you know, witness and evangelize door to door, you know, kind of like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses do. You know, knock on the door, you know, um, size up the person, you know, evaluate them and their clothing, you know, and kind of stick your foot in the door, you know, so that way if they slam the door, you know, you got it open still, you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, wait a minute. That was Christians in Action. Remember them? Yeah, and the Jesus movement. You know, we had this one place that was just outside of Bakersfield, you know. They were called Christians in Action. They were like the confrontational Christian manual dedicated people of the world, you know. And they, they had all these little freebie booklets, you know. You got them free. Pretty sure it's free. It's still, they might even still be around, so they're probably going to hate me for making this video. <laughs> God bless you if you're part of Christians in Action, whatever it was. Anyways, it was CIA and, and it was always funny because my roommate had this material, you know, and I went and got my own later on, like about, I don't know, maybe five years later, I think, you know, and it was, it was interesting, to say the least, but it would tell you all these little tricks and techniques to do when you are witnessing door to door, you know, like two of you should be there and you should eyeball, you know, the, the man, you know, and you should look at him, but he's not going to be the one that you're going to save because the woman is the one you're talking to. And it was all kinds of weird, I mean, just psychology and sociology and salesmanship and gimmicks and all this stuff worked in. Now, they put it out into a good outline. I mean, don't get me wrong. It looked very professional. It sounded very good. It was like, really, if you didn't know what you were doing, you could sell magazines using that. <laughs> Whoa. Maybe they do. <laughs> Selling Christianity is popular nowadays, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. Of course, that's part of the problem, is that if you're wanting to develop a relationship as opposed to a religion, then you kind of got to balance, you know, one with the other. You know, you, your religion is, you know, you religiously read your Bible. You know, you study that. You kind of apply it, you know, and you kind of work it, you know, and you work out your salvation. But when you have a relationship, that enhances your religion to make it applicable to you so that you will have that with which you will be able to be presented before the Father with exceeding joy, which is Jesus in you. You see, that's where kind of like people forget when they get all wrapped up into getting saved. All of a sudden they have to fix that person or save that person or do this or do that. And, you know, they they get all this work going, you know, and they're like so busy tossing things up in the air, you know, this theology, that theology, that one's right, that one's wrong, this one's cool, this one's not, this one's going to be this way, that one's going to be that way. They forget one thing. Just one. The one thing that you and I, maybe, I can't because I'm in this ministry, so I don't even get a chance to get around that one. But the one thing that maybe you forget, did God tell you to? You see, there's a whole theology behind this idea of God's providence, God's will, God's perfect will, God's permissive will, and all kinds of theological terminologies that I could throw at you for your homiletic and your hermeneutic, and you know we could dissertate on it and get a complete exegesis of the word, you know, and make a complete theological premise, and I could do that for whichever denomination you want to come from, or whichever religion you want to come from, or whichever framework of mindset you want to come from, because I used to practice it, because I wanted to understand where they were coming from, and what they limited God could do in their framework and their mindset, so that I could minister to them according to their way of thinking, and then minister to them according to their way of thinking, because guess what? A lot of people seem to be doing this with God. They box him into their own understanding. Now me, God kept blowing my mind because he'd pick me up and throw me into some baptism. And I'd go, what do you mean divorce is the unpardonable sin? Huh? And then he'd pick me up and he'd throw me into some Lutherans. I'd go, Luther who? 
Then he picked me up and told me some Greek Orthodox or Armenians, you know, and I'd go, huh? You know, and then I'd get picked up and thrown in some Charismatics. And, what? You know, and then I'd go over here, you know, and man, it was like, inside the Catholic Church you had like billions, of course it wasn't, of different sects. <laughs> man, I was learning all kinds of stuff from people. And I'd be going, Jesus, what do you want me to learn here? Can I move on? You know, can we do something else for a while? You know, and it was cool. You know, I mean, I enjoy it, you know, but I always wanted to understand where they were coming from. And so, God showed me. I didn't always, you know, agree with what they were doing, but God showed me how He used them at different times and different places and severally as the Spirit of God led them. And a lot of them, you know, I can't qualify what they did or didn't do is right or wrong because at the time that may have been the Lord leading them so I don't know when the Lord leads you He leads you you know and believe me when God led me some places I was going ain't nobody gonna believe this Lord so you know you and me we ain't doing the Abraham routine I am not you can do anything you want with me God but I am not sacrificing anybody on the altar I'm sorry that's just one place I draw the line okay maybe I didn't draw the line and there is a dead kid somewhere around I'm kidding I'm kidding it's a joke it's funny that's how people take it. See, they get too serious. And that's the problem about religion. They get too serious. They're so, oh my God, we got to warn those people. Oh, quick, we got to save them from that false teacher because after all, God can't take care of them. You know, we learned this at Calvary Chapel a long time ago. We had, you know, the drive-in church down the street, you know, and it was popular because you could drive right through and give a sermon, you know, drive through, you know, drive through. <laughs> you know, it was a drive-in theater, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, they, they had the you know, sermon going and later became Crystal Cathedral and you know they kind of did their thing and people used to criticize him and yell at him and scream and holler and rant and rave you know whatever and uh, but the one thing that kept happening was you know people kept getting saved they may not have stayed there very long or maybe they stayed a while and then left but people got saved there you know and now we have other people that you know people rant and rave and complain about you know blah 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 kind of like you know Joel Osteen's you know or the Benny Hinn's you know or the whatever they are you know God I'm sure he's going to judge every man according to his works. Some works, hey, going to be like, you know, tried by fire. Hey, cool, that's that's gold and silver. You know, and that's, that's wonderful. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Because I told you to do it and I blessed you through it, you're going to get from it what I want to bless you with because you're blessed because you did what I told you to do. So it's gold, silver, precious jewels. But I threw another one over here. Sorry, some of those works weren't quite done the way I said to. You know, out of love, mercy, and peace, and joy. But you wanted to be seen of men, so guess what? I had to throw some of your works over here. So it kind of like got burned up. <laughs> it had a lot of pride in it. You know, a lot of air and oxygen for the fire. So it kind of went poof, poof. It was a flash flame. It just wiped it all out. And you're going, really? What was it? And God says, don't worry about it. It's gone. I wiped it out. So those works of your flesh, you know, where you did things with not quite the right attitude, you know, or you did it to be seen of men, you know, kind of like what I'm doing right now with this video. I'm being seen of men, so I kind of feel like the Lord isn't really going to reward me, you know, about anything that's being done right now. But maybe if some of you go do something good, I might get some benefit from it, you know, maybe down the road. Who knows, you know, interest. Lord, please. But the reality is I don't do this because... <laughs> I'm expecting a reward from it because in reality according to my conscience it says let your conscience be your guide and my studies of the word of God because I'm out here obvious to all of you I don't think I get any benefit or blessing from doing this ministry the things that I've done behind the scenes that you don't see I think that is what the Lord accounts unto me for righteousness and my gold silver and precious jewels the one or two that I have that <laughs> remember I only want in the kingdom of you know the millennial kingdom when it's coming uh, Jesus sets up on the earth the only thing I want is just you know like a little cottage you know kind of like a little hut maybe even just a tent you know maybe a mishpaka you know that's a tabernacle maybe a little tent you know or a holeka maybe a little tent over here you know um, mishpaka is fellowship you know but anyways a fellowship tent that I could have a mishpaka or holeka but um, anyways have a little tent next to a lake, you know, kind of have a little garden pot, you know, where I could grow some grapes, you know, a little tree, you know, kind of sit under the shade, you know, relax for about a thousand years. But in the meantime, you know, I do this because I love it. It's like, 
man, don't you realize what sharing the Word of God is like? It's like, ooh, life. Man, God forbid that I would not share because I'd feel like, ooh, and then my day would be like, yeah, I think I'll go, you know, like watch TV, you know. That's always fun. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Uh, I know what some of you are doing. Watching TV. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> grace abounds and much more grace more abounds. Uh, never mind the sin. We, we'll, we won't go there. But for now, you know, besides these two things about the gold hay, or the gold hay, the gold, precious stones and silver that, you know, were good works and the wood hay and stubble that bad works, there's also something that people don't realize when they want to stop someone from falsing, you know, finding a false teacher. God forbid that they get messed up and lose their salvation somehow. Oh yeah, like they're going to lose their salvation. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, if you go to a false prophet, you're going to lose your salvation because somehow God's going to take it away from you. I don't think so. <laughs> you may not accomplish what God wants you to do, but I don't think you're going to lose your salvation. You know, it's kind of one of those, you know, if God saves you and He's working on you, He's going to lead you into something and He'll lead you out of it, you know, because it says that He's the one who leads us. The footsteps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your path. Maybe... The reason why some people are where they are is because God directed them there. Hot show bow. What do you say? God will lead somebody to a false teacher? <laughs> God will lead them out of the false teacher. That I know. If he could lead them out, couldn't he lead them in? Or would he allow them to go there by their own personal choice and suffer the consequences of their own actions? You see, we all have that with which we grow thereby in. Because none of us follow God perfectly. And it's not permissive will or perfect will. It's choices. It's suffering the consequences of choices. Because you see, when Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount was basically how to live. He said, if you do these sayings of mine, you'll be likened unto a man who built his house upon a rock. It was solid. And when the storms of life came and the winds blew, nothing shook, nothing moved. It was built solidly on these sayings of mine, everything that he taught on the Sermon on the Mount. But he said, if you don't do these sayings of mine, you'll be likened to the man who built his house upon sand. And when the storms came and the floods ravaged that house, he was devastated, annihilated. God's got it covered. He knows how to take care of his own. Those that are false teachers, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, likewise, I know you did miracles and I know you did all these things, but depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So, if they are really what you think they are, he's taking care of it. But, if you're blessed of the Father, then you're too busy doing those things that he said to do, which was to take care of the poor and the needy and all the other things. So you see, we really don't need to focus in on what's wrong with these people over there. You know, we keep pointing them out and more people keep going because it's like, wow, really? They say that? Okay, let me go check it out. You know, and they get involved and they get into it. But you know, when somebody has a personal relationship with Jesus, when somebody is obviously in love with God, <laughs> when somebody's getting a kick out of life and they've just been kicked into Jesus, they know there's something weird about that person. He must be a Jesus freak. That's all he seems to talk about. Man, that guy's a weirdo. A Jesus weirdo. And then they want to know, what makes you so strange? <laughs> you can tell, hey, it's Jesus. So you see, getting carried away in being distracted away from the things that God told you today is where the difference is between the man who has things that are done in the flesh, things that are done in the spirit, or things that are done without the will of God in it. Because it boils down to, in all three occasions, doing what God told you to do today. That's why the scripture is very clear. Very clear. It's so clear. It's like a blue sky in a sunny day. <laughs> how clear is it? Such a deer, I can tell you how clear it is. <laughs> no, it's clear. The scripture says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, because the reality is, God is speaking to you today. God speaks to you every day of your life. 
And it's not just a Bible study, because you see, I can pick up this Bible, and you can pick any topic in the world you want, because I studied this thing cover to cover for 30 years, 35 years, 40 years, a lot of years. And any subject you want to talk about, I'll give you scripture on it. And then I'll even expound upon it. Of course, you don't want me talking because you know what? I keep talking on it. You know I could. And I could expound on it from different points of view. When I was in Jerusalem, I had to do that too. <laughs> wow, living in Jerusalem, that was kind of a trip. Man, we were arguing from all kinds of different points of view. Matter of fact, I loved it when they kept saying, it's a Jewish state. And I kept saying, no, it's not. It's a Zionist state. And they kept saying, Zionism is Judaism. I said, no, it's not. It's Zionism. <laughs> it was like, oh, that's fun. It was kind of fun playing with that because it was like Torah students, you know, and they were like young, you know, and I'd already had them eat, you know. I was eating them for lunch <laughs> until, you know, kind of like the soldiers kind of pushed us all out of the square. <laughs> that was interesting, too. And then up there on the corner, I noticed that there was a rabbi up there filming with a camera. Kind of funny, those sneaky little rabbis, or at least I should have said an Orthodox Jew. He may not have been a rabbi. Kind of sneaky, some of those, you know, Orthodox Jews when they're filming in public that you don't know that they're filming behind the scenes when they're watching you to make sure that they have a record of what's going on according to what they see and trying to observe and making sure that they're not one of those Messianic Jews or one of those Jews over there trying to witness somebody or convert someone into being a Christian. God forbid. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's what I was doing. <laughs> Whoops! Ah! They got me on camera! <laughs> Hide! Oh no! Spiros, where are you? Spiros, Spiros. He's a New York Jew. <laughs> we had a great time there. There was three of us there. They called us the Three Musketeers. You know, we'd go witnessing. Well, we'd go passing out tracks in Mea Shireen, which is, you don't do that in Mea Shireen. We went, like, you know, on Shabbos. <laughs> you don't do that on Shabbos. And we did it, like, after dark, you know, when you could really get away with it. Put it right up on the porch. Ooh, we could have been killed, much less stoned. <laughs> Believe me, they would have used real stones. But yes, the tracks were in Hebrew and they were printed in Israel, but then it's a long story. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> it was fun time. But the point is, is that unless God tells you what to do today, you don't know what you should do. You don't know where you should go. You don't know how you should be. You don't know really what you can do because in this, you could make up your own religion and go about it every day. And you could be a born-again Christian. Don't get me wrong. You could be saying the right things. You could be acting the right way. You could have your theology down. You could have your hermeneutic, the way of you arranging your life, uh, the way of you, uh, your not hermeneutic. Hermeneutic, you could have every word in the scriptures down where you understand it and you apply it accordingly to your life as your homiletic is. Uh, yeah, homiletic is applied to your life in such a way that you are obviously Christian-like. But then, wait a minute, that's what the Mormons do. That's what the Quakers do. That's what the Catholics do. That's what a lot of denominations do. So what makes you different? You see, there's a difference between having a religious observation of being able to quote, denote, argue, debate, and keep arguing endlessly on the scripture. But did you know there's a better way? Did you know there really is? Jesus did it. He simply asked, you know, he says, hey, look, you know, I know you want to argue, because you know, they always came up to him to argue. And he says, well, what did the scripture say? He knew what the scripture said, but he didn't argue about it. He just says, what did the scripture say and how do you interpret them? So according to their interpretation, he would answer them, the heart of the matter. And you know what's interesting? All of his responses always brought it back to you were dealing with God himself in the flesh, and he was dealing with your heart in your flesh. And he somehow was always able to confront the real issue. He was able to see the heart and he did it in such a way that he wasn't confrontational about it. He was caring and concerned about you personally because he dealt with people one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, the crowds, yeah, he told stuff too, but we are recorded in individual conversations how he cared about the person, the individual. And that's where we are today. God cares about you, the individual, to have a personal relationship with him so that you wouldn't be stuck in religion but that you would bind them together on your heart that you would have a balance of the two you would religiously exercise your relationship every day walking with God and talking with him because that's what he promised he said me and my father he said we'll come to you now 
Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, he says in provocation. We will open the door if you'll just if you'll just open the door. We will come in and sup with you even. We will make ourselves obvious to you. We will speak to you. I have said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another. I will make my voice known to you. And that was God speaking to you. So you see, you could stick with religion and never hear God speak. Oh, he'll reveal the Spirit of God now. The Spirit of God will highlight a portion of Scripture. He'll inspire your mind to kind of walk, work it out logically. You'll kind of work it, you know, in some way to fit it into some kind of pragmatic dogma, you know, that applies to your life religiously. But except the Spirit of God do that, you're kind of like working it one way and hopefully he's working it with you. Because it's easy to deceive yourself when you're only working it religiously. And you know as well as I do, there are dead religions out there that are called Christian that have nothing to do with the Spirit of God in them. But if you have the Spirit of God in you, He's desiring not to give you all these good gifts and fruits of Spirit, because He does that automatically. He's leading you, guiding you, inviting you, providing you, convicting you of sin, developing you, you know, teaching you how to have a personal relationship with God and all that kind of stuff. But He wants to reveal Jesus, to unveil the Son of God to you, to remind you of all the words that Jesus said and to comfort you according to what Jesus said. He said the Father would send the Comforter to you and he would do those things. So if you're not moving on with getting to know Jesus, your devotional life is really suffering because except that God tell you each day what to do, you might be going your own way. You might be doing it the hard way because God's trying to bring you around and if God can't speak to you directly to bring you around, He'll speak to you through His Word to bring you around. He'll speak to you after that through His church to bring you around. After that, He'll speak to you through His prophets to bring you around. After that, He'll bring some donkey in your life to bring you around. After that, He'll take the circumstances of life to bring you around. And He'll use all of these things to bring you around to Him. Because He loves you. Because He wants to spend time with you. He doesn't just love you and says, Okay, now go your way. You got your own thing, you know, go play a football game, you know, go do your thing and just give me credit, you know, when it's done. He loves you to spend time with you, to have a personal intimacy with God. He loves you because he wants you to be, like of those three, the one with the jewels, the gold, and the precious silver. Not because he wants to give you those things, but because he wants you to walk with him in doing those things that are pleasing in his sight. He wants you to walk with God. He wants you to talk with Him. He wants you to be like Enoch, spending time every day with God and walking away with Him till one day you're found no more because you're gone. That's what we are about today. That's what devotionals are about every day. That's why we share and we implore and we say, listen, speak to Him, talk to Him. He's willing. He's there. You will know him. He will hear his voice. He will, you will. You will hear his voice. <laughs> he already can hear your voice. No problem. You've been talking to him all along. Love and laugh. <laughs> yeah, right. Work for me. Work with me. Work through me. All work to last must be done in my spirit and not of the flesh. How silently my spirit works, that which you do not see. How gently and gradually souls are led into my kingdom by my will and my way. Love and laughter form the plow that prepares the ground for the seed. Enjoy your relationship with me. Remember this, if the ground is hard, seed will not grow there. So prepare the soil for the time when that seed begins to root, that there might be the softness of the ground full of moisture to draw from, that it would grow and not perish in the coming sunlight, or be stomped on by the feet of men. Prepare the ground and prepare it as I say to do. Each and every person is like a pot that God has planted 
and there's soil in and your seed goes in and sometimes some people's pots really look potted. Some people, as soon as they get ripped down, they can move into a bigger pot. Some people, God keeps pruning, you know, and keeps pruning your roots too because he keeps them like tiny. Like a little bonsai tree. Getting old and tiny. But they got little fruits. We all are placed in a certain place by God to do according to His will as He chooses. The decision by you every day is will you do His will or will you do your will? Today, harden not your heart, it says provocation. If you hear His voice, do it His way and ask Him to walk with you in the way. Because for me today, I don't want to go forward and I don't want to go back and I don't want to go to the left and I don't want to go to the right and I don't want to go up and I don't want to go down unless God is with me every step of the way. So what I do is I say, hey, you know God, I know you told me to go do that, but you know what? How about you go with me? Let's, let's walk arm in arm and talk about it. Let's spend some time together while we do it. And then it's kind of like living all day long with God because God's in it. Now, can you hear me? That still small voice inside you? It just might one day be loud enough to hear outside you. Bless you.